Good morning friends, happy Tuesday. I hope your week is going well. I'm back with some more bio news for today. To begin with, we're gonna talk about a paper by Shidia Bier et al, I can't pronounce the name, I do apologize, about the biology of ketamine in humans. Um, to begin with, it summarizes some of the research on ketamine, which I thought would be interesting to viewers who haven't been following it. Number one, ketamine has been shown in human studies to, to produce an acute but short-acting antidepressant effect that can be sustained with repeated administration, and that the second chronic effect that's sustained with repeated administration can be maintained while lowering the ketamine dose over time. Good news. Rodent studies have shown that thrice weekly injections produce the lasting antidepressant effects and that these antidepressant effects are modulated by dopaminergic and serotonergic signaling. In human clinical trials, this thrice weekly injection schedule worked for up to two weeks. Acutely, a single ketamine injection increases dopaminergic and noradrenergic activity uh, in neurons, but not serotonergic neuronal fire firing. It, uh, it's also been shown to increase glutamatergic synaptic potentiation because ketamine, by the way, is an NMDA receptor antagonist. If you want to learn more about that, search NMDA on my channel. You'll find an interesting video on the subject. Or well, I think it's interesting. Anyway, the point is that NM, uh, so ketamine uh, blocks this group of glutamatergic uh, receptors. Glutamate is the primary excitatory uh, neurotransmitter in the nervous system. By blocking the NMDA receptors, which are very associated with chronic inflammation and over-signaling over time, ketamine actually enhances the synaptic potentiation of AMPA receptors, increasing the AMPA to NMDA ratio. That's what we're describing here. Note that blocking the NMDA receptors inhibits the, uh, abolishes the five day trailing effect on dopaminergic signaling that you find in rodents when they're given a single administration of cocaine, which is quite interesting. This study found that despite ketamine's affinity for, the, for CERT, which is the serotonin transporter, it does not seem to inhibit serotonin's reuptake much, acutely or chronically. It does not increase serotonergic neuronal firing. Specifically, it does enhance extracellular serotonin in the prefrontal cortex a day after a single injection in rodents. This has been shown in a previous study. So serotonergic action cannot be entirely ruled out, but it's not occurring through the inhibition of the CERT transporter, which SSRIs do and many other drugs do. It does not inhibit, it, it does not inhibit serotonergic neuronal firing as some uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors and SSRIs do via their activity at the 5-HT1A uh, receptor, which is an autoreceptor that senses serotonin and then reduces the activity of those receptors. So ketamine doesn't do that. It doesn't reduce the availability of the serotonin receptors. Now, while a single injection increases norepinephrine signaling for less than one day, norepinephrine is noradrenaline. It's the kind of adrenaline used in our nervous system, by the way. The adrenaline in our body mostly is adrenaline, whereas in the brain it's mostly noradrenaline. We also call this epinephrine and norepinephrine. So while a single administration increases norepinephrine signaling for less than a day, the repeated administration elevates it for even three days after a final injection. This is not due to decreased NMDA signaling activity, but is dependent on an increased AMPA signaling activity that is consequent to the blocking of NMDA. The paper also found that while a single injection of ketamine increases norepinephrine signaling for um, less than a day, repeated administration in rodents elevates it for up to three days following the final injection. Now, the authors thought that this, this increase in norepinephrine signaling may be due to ketamine's blockade of the NMDA receptors, um, particularly on GABAergic neurons, but it does not seem to be the case. It seems to be due to the increase of AMPA signaling as opposed to NMDA signaling, increasing noradrenergic signaling in the body. Please excuse my dog. I'm not sure if you guys can hear him. He's in the other room barking a little bit. But I just wanted to mention a final note about this paper that's been very interesting. The paper entirely did not discuss ketamine's activity at the mu opioid receptor, which I find to be a very mysterious and interesting subject and probably the reason for the dopaminergic transmission downstream, but I don't know. It may be also due to the AMPA activation, but I don't know. We've seen in other studies though that a blockade of the mu opioid receptor inhibits the antidepressant effects of ketamine, although they don't seem to be derived from that. So who knows what's going on exactly, but it's still an interesting paper. I highly recommend you guys check it out. Oh, I also wanted to mention there's one final note from the paper. In drug-naive rodents, 
Repeated ketamine administration was necessary to increase the dopaminergic neuronal activity for three days following the final administration, meaning it didn't happen from a single one in drug naive rodents. I found this to be an interesting subject because sometimes people will take Adderall or an amphetamine or something like that. And the first time they take it, they don't get enhanced focus or concentration. In fact, I didn't myself. I remember when I was, uh, it must have been 18 year or 19 years old, and I was first prescribed 15 milligrams of Adderall as an adult. The first time I took it, I recall thinking I should be feeling like I'm in the movie Limitless or something like that. I think Limitless came out after this, but I had that feeling like, you know, my brain should just be, you know, activating just way more efficiently and I should feel it immediately. And I didn't. I didn't notice it the first time or the second time probably I took it. So it's pretty interesting. It seems to cause a reorganization in the brain and you have to be adapted to it in some way. And in this study, the ketamine does that with dopaminergic uh, signaling in the rodents as well. The first one doesn't do this long lasting dopaminergic effect, but multiple administration in drug naive rodents does. Anyway, again, they didn't talk about the more opioid receptor, so it was a big, uh, I don't know why they didn't do that in the study. Now, a second study by Lou et al. concerns autism and SNPs in the serotonin and dopamine receptor genes. What they found was specifically that RS6311, which is a very famous SNP in the HTR2A gene, which is the serotonin 2A receptor gene, which it codes for the serotonin series 2 a receptors. So they found the polymorphism RS6311 to be uh, significantly associated with autism, where homozygotes of C were 1.8 times more likely to be autistic than homozygotes of T. And uh, RS6313, also at the same receptor, further magnified this risk, but didn't do so on its own, in the case that someone has the uh, allele G. In the case that they do have G, the C allele from the previous SNP and the G allele from this NP, SNP represents a far more likely to become autistic uh, genotype than the TA haplot haplotype at the respective SNPs. By the way, guys, you can go on your own 23andMe and you can search RS6311 and then search RS6313 and find out what your alleles are there. And by the way, this is very important also for SSRI's effects on neurogenesis because this 5-HT2A is a primary target of both psilocybin and SSRIs and so on. In a third paper by Park et al., this paper regards the uh, phytochemical from green tea called GCG and glutamatergic activity in the brain. Uh, it's an in vitro study though. I, I usually wouldn't include this in bio news, but I'm including it for my clients who question why I, I often include green tea extracts in their uh, nootropic sort of formulation. So, what, what this paper did was assay several phytochemicals from green tea for their antioxidant capacity with two assays, namely the DPPH assay and the DCFDA assay. What they found is that uh, gallocatechin gallate, which is GCG, not EGCG, but GCG. EGCG is also very potent, but GCG was the most, had the strongest antioxidant potential at those two assays. They also found that GCG's protective effect over glutamate excitotoxicity, remember, glutamate, the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system, can cause too much uh, um, excitatory activity at neurons that it's firing at, causing them to incur free, rad free radical induced damage and potentially apoptosis. So it was shown that GCG is able to inhibit this via reducing intracellular free radicals, via reducing calcium influx, and by inhibiting the phosphorylation of what's called extracellular signal regulated kinase, which is ERK, and C John N terminal kinases, which are called JNK. In a paper by Scrapitz et al. concerning growth hormone, releasing hormone, and the, and the hypothalamus. So this is really interesting, fascinating paper, very exciting. So what they discovered was something, this is a very interesting study. So they discovered something that they called a cryptic gonadotropin releasing hormone neuronal system in the basal, human basal ganglia. What does this mean by cryptic? Well, we thought historically, so just to remind everybody, gonadotropin releasing hormone is a hormone that is thought to be released only by cells in the hypothalamus of the brain. They're so th th these, this hormone is gonadotropin releasing hormone is received by cells in the pituitary that have a gonadotropin releasing hormone receptor. And those and cells in the pituitary then synthesize luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone to stimulate the gonads of the male species to produce sperm and to produce testosterone. Not respectively, the reverse, exactly. Luteinizing hormone to produce testosterone and follicle stimulating hormone to produce sperm, uh, to differentiate and proliferate sperm. So what's interesting here is this study found that there are actually 
So the hypothalamus contains only 2,000 or so gonadotropin-releasing hormone cells. But this paper found that we carry actually 150 to 200,000 cells that may potentially release gonad or synthesize gonadotropin-releasing hormone. And we contain these in the basal ganglia and the basal forebrain. Shocking. So that it's not limited entirely to the hypothalamus. This is a real discovery and definitely be belongs in our series BioNews. The next paper is by Shavaria et al. Um, by the way, I should mention, the reason I might not be smiling as much today, I've recently taken a pill of dutasteride. And I'm not entirely sure, but it's... I took it two days ago, but I was taking cerebrolysin at the time, and it may have inhibited some of the anxiogenic effects of totally inhibiting 5AR 5, 5 in the body. I'm <laughs> noticing a little bit of anxiogenic effects today. I don't know if it's because of the dutasteride, so please forgive me for not smiling as much as I normally would be. Anyway, the next paper is by Shavaria et al. It concerns some um, derivatives of of the molecule piperine, which is found in pepper, particularly antioxidant, uh, it's a compound derived of piperine, particularly. It's antioxidant 2 and antioxidant uh, uh, 3. Uh, they are a safe mitochondrial uh, targeted antioxidant that both inhibit the enzyme acetylcholesterase and monoamine oxidase, which as you can imagine could be very useful for people with uh, conditions, uh, neurodegenerative disease conditions and stuff like that. A paper by Carpenter et al. Uh, introduced this concept uh, of a phenotypic kind of depression they call circadian depression. So they identified this as treatment resistant. It is It has bipolarity, meaning cyclothemia, meaning people get up and down. It has an early age of onset. It has concurrent cardiometabolic and inflammatory disturbances. Now, I just want to mention for the audience to know, your serotonin levels decline during the day also. I didn't, I'm not sure if I was able to read this paper or not, or I was only able to read the abstract. I can't remember now, it was a few days ago, but serotonin increases during the day, uh, partially because of signaling from light and declines at night. So it's an interesting concept and uh, maybe this supports sort of the serotonin hypothesis of depression or the monoamine hypothesis of depression at least. A paper by Brophy et al. concerns the epigenetic transmission of de depression-related genes. So what they found was a population-based study in, in Wales. They found that if mothers were depressed only while pregnant, their offspring were uh, 1.2 times more likely to be depressed later in life. If they were depressed only after pregnancy, the children were 1.55 times more likely or they had a 55% more likelihood to de de develop depression later in life. Whereas mothers who were depressed both during and after uh, pregnancy, what they called chronic depression, the offspring were 1.73 times more likely to be depressed later in life. A paper by Guao et al. concerns the loss of consciousness that comes from a GABA-A receptor agonists that are uh, anesthetics. In particular, they did a neuroimaging study of brain-induced anesthetic, or, or sorry, of, uh, <laughs> of anesthetic-induced loss of consciousness. What they found was that even when they caused the loss of consciousness in brains using GABA-A receptor agonists, there was still glutamatergic activity in the brain, making them postulate that the reason for the loss of consciousness basically was because of uh, problems in the inhibitory system, in the GABA system, as opposed to problems in the glutamatergic system. I'm particularly very interested in the concept of loss of consciousness and how it affects our health because my great grandfather, who was very healthy at the age of 96, about a year and a half ago, um, unfortunately fell one day and broke a leg. When he broke that leg, they put him under generalized anesthesia in his surgery. And following that anesthesia, he became, he had memory issues like a week later and continued to have them for the rest of his life. Also, his health really dramatically took a turn for the worse and he died within a year after the, the fall and the anesthesia. So it made me start to think about this idea that if the brain is totally, totally turned off, which apparently it's not because of the study, we find there's still glutamatergic activity in those people that have anesthesia induced loss of consciousness. But my idea was if the brain is totally turned off, maybe that itself is neurotoxic. Which made me then get in contact with, some of you maybe um, have heard of Walker, the sleep scientist. I got in contact with the head of his research lab to ask to, to you know, inquire as to, I had a theory basically for why we go into cycles of REM sleep during the night. I thought maybe that's simply to gain consciousness in our brain. So we don't develop the neurotoxic effects of a la lack of activity in the brain. Anyway, I've been talking to them about it. And really this was all inspired by my great grandfather's experiences. Uh, in a paper by Sadamitsu et al. This paper involves um, what's called low intensity pulsed ultrasound therapy. 
used in rodents following a simulated stroke. A stroke is when uh, a brain does not have enough oxygen supply, they have hypoxia, and because of the hypoxia, which involves also less blood signaling in the area, that's where it originates from, there's less blood in the area, there's a necrosis of tissue in the brain. In normal strokes, there's an acute effect that's on the necrosis tissue death in the brain, but then there's a sustained effect after the stroke. Now, we can't really inhibit that uh, initial effect unless, I mean, generally, actually, most of the studies find difficulty inhibiting that. But generally, this, the intent is to inhibit the second effect. Anyway, this study found that this uh, lipos therapy improved um, cognition following the simulated stroke by upregulating the factor of vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, as well as endothelial nitric oxide, which is uh, synthase, which is the which is the enzyme that produces nitric oxide in blood vessels to vasodilate them. VEGF is a growth factor that causes angiogenesis, the birth of new blood vessels. So it seems that the um, this kind of pulsed ultrasound therapy is increasing these uh, the growth factor and their the VEGF and therefore the nitric oxide synthase. Finally, the final paper for today, sorry for the long bio news today, guys. The final paper is by Romeo et al. In this meta-analysis of 20 st uh, studies, they found that the intensity of the subjective experience following a psychedelic therapy for depressed people was associated with their recovery. Uh, it was the most impactful effect for the resulting um, um, sorry, it was the most impactful factor for the resulting effect on their depression or addictive behaviors, psychiatric or addictive behaviors. The mechanism seems to be they postulate via three ways, either by 5-HT2, which we've discussed earlier in this video, via disrupting and then rebuilding the default mode network, which I want to talk about for a bit, and then or by inhibiting infl inflammation in a, in a delayed uh, sense. It can't just be a single inhibition of uh, of that of inflammation. Now, the interesting thing is this. So, what is this concept of disrupting and then rebuilding the default mode network? So, when you sit in a in a bus on your way to work, if you have a if you if you're unfortunate enough to take a bus like I used to, you'll find that sometimes uh, you'll drift off into thought, looking at a window outside, and certain thoughts will come into your brain. For example, if you don't take a bus, you may meditate. When you meditate, certain thoughts will also come into your brain without you try, being able to control them, without even the salience of your exterior environment. They'll just come from within your brain. These thoughts are guided by a network of connectivity in the brain called the default mode network. Meditation weakens this network over time or strengthens what's called the salience network, which is able to switch your brain from this default network, default mode network, into what's called the executive control network. So the idea here is that this intensity of subjective experience when you trip out on mushrooms breaks down the default mode network and allows it to rebuild in a way that's not pathologic. Because in psychiatry, one of the things that's been discovered is the activity of the default mode network, particularly in guiding our brain to thoughts that are hurtful or damaging to our psyches. For example, say you made a mistake earlier in life, you may find yourself repetitively thinking over that mistake, blaming yourself for it, and that neural thought pattern leading you into deeper states of depression. So the idea here is to sort of inhibit the direction that that default mode network is taking. Interestingly, by the way, if you increase neurogenesis, you'll still have a default mode network, but it won't take you on as negative uh, thought patterns. And remember that neurons that fire together, wire together. So you have to break that thought pattern to be able to get past it. Anyway, guys, I wish you a great day this Tuesday, and I'll see you soon.